to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. Today, I have Vanessa Shepard with me. Vanessa's company is called She's Got Vision. And Vanessa tells us that if you are a creative business owner and you've got blog posts to write, client projects to finish, and family to manage, and she says fur babies count as family too, then you might be thinking you need a little bit more time to breathe. And she says if that describes you, then you're in the right spot. So today we're going to talk with Vanessa about how creative entrepreneurs struggle with getting things done in their business. And then just not how we struggle with getting it done in our business, but how she helps us to stand out in the crowd by working with us a little bit of strategy, okay? She's won awards, been recognized in our communities. She thrives on her family time, her vacation time, and she seems to have it all down pat. So I'm looking forward to speaking with her today and sharing her wisdom with you. Before we get to the show, I just want to remind you that the show is sponsored by Article.com. Article.com can help you too with your busy interior design life because they have tons of mid-century Scandinavian inspired furniture ready for you to specify on your next project. So easy. Their trade division is so organized that it just makes it So simple to specify and to order and to have it delivered. Their return policy is over the top easy. Not that you'll probably have to return too much because the quality is just fabulous. So if you need to find uh, mid-century styled furniture for living rooms, dining rooms, offices, and outdoor spaces, please open your trade account at Article today. Go to welldesigned.article.com. Okay, and be sure to specify something for your next project. And maybe you'll come on the show and tell me what you liked and what you thought of the quality and the process of working with the trade team at article.com. That's welldesigned.article.com. All right, let me introduce you to Vanessa Shepard. Hi, Vanessa. Thanks so much for joining me on A Well-Designed Business today. Thanks for having me, Luann. It's great to be here. So, Vanessa, you intrigued me when we came across you. My team found you and sent me an email and said, what do you think about this lady? And I'm like, she looks like a rock star. (laughs) So I was like, let's have a conversation. You are talking exactly to us. Your specialty is helping creatives with, I guess, not just uh, their Pinterest, but their social media strategy. It almost sounds like that you have a little bit of time management in there. Um, You're a big proponent from what I read of getting the work done, doing it well, but making sure that you have some time to live your life as well. Would you agree with that, that what I've learned about you so far, Vanessa? Absolutely. I'm all about kind of bringing in efficiency to everything you do, whether it's you know, churning up content marketing or whether you're just coming up with new ideas. I want that to be as efficient as possible because we don't need any additional overwhelm in our lives. I love it. I love it. You know, I have my friend, Amber De La Garza, the productivity specialist. I might have to hook you two up because you probably, you know, would geek out together on all things efficient. <laughs> so, love efficiency. Right, right, right. So t- today we're going to talk about Pinterest a little. Okay. So of course we've had um, episodes number 292 with Summer Tanhauser. We had episode 223, Allison 
Bannon, who is an interior designer in Texas, who had a really good, strong strategy for Pinterest. Um, and then we had Kate All, episode number 331. Kate and Summer are uh, Power Talk Friday experts that specialize in Pinterest. And, um, but but Pinterest changes. It's one of those ever moving platforms. And of course, I also say and know that we need to hear things a couple of times. And sometimes that one time the light bulb goes off. So we decided that today you and I would talk about um, some strategies for growth for your interior design th firm through Pinterest and also strategies for leverage leveraging the content that we're already creating and maximizing it through Pinterest, right? That's right. Okay. Where do you want to start? How do you want to start us off, Vanessa? Um, I think I'm going to touch on the biggest update that's coming up for Pinterest right now. Um, the platform has changed a little bit, but not fundamentally not a lot in the last um, few years. But the big change that they're introducing is something called pin titles. So that's where um, Pinterest is feeling that SEO on the platform needs a little bit of work and that they're wanting to put more emphasis behind pin titles. Okay. And what a pin title is, is it's a short, up to about 100 characters of bold text that provides more context to your pin in the feed and when you're looking at a pin really close up. So when someone winds up seeing your pin in the feed or in a search result, the first 30 characters or so of that title is what they'll see under the image. And that'll give them um, kind of a sense of what your content's actually about, and that'll help them to click through to it. It'll also help it come up um, in search results a little bit better if you have a nice um, keyword rich pin title to help people connect with the information that they're actually searching for. So the first 30 characters is what we see, but this pin titles includes the first 100 characters and that's just more opportunity for us to put in those keyword search, um, those, those rich keyword search terms. Is that what you're saying? Yep, that's right. Okay, so give me an example of a pin. Say that we're a pin title. So I don't know if you want to use one of your own examples. It might be easier. Or if I said to you, we're looking at a beautiful kitchen, it's white cabinets, it's a marble top, it's got a black island, and it has a brass light fixture over the island. Are, is, are, is this the type of thing we're putting all of this somehow in a keyword search because those are the things that our potential clients might be searching? Um, those kind of like descriptive little shit statements, like what you said, like marble countertop, white cabinets, those fit really well in the actual description of the pin. In the title itself, I would want to see something like um, marble bright white kitchen, you know, something that kind of describes the, the look and feel of how that kitchen feels. Okay. So that people kind of get a sense of, oh, okay, that's the type of image that I want to achieve. And then when they type that in and it brings that image up, then they're visually selecting that kitchen with those brass light fixtures um, to match that vibe that they're going for. Okay. Okay. Um, so, so this is a big thing. What was it beforehand? I don't really go on Pinterest that much, so I'm not that familiar <laughs> with how it works. No worries. So before you had the option to provide a pin title, but it wasn't mandatory. So um, you could give like, if you're doing a blog post about this awesome bright white kitchen, you would have had a title if it was, if you had your rich pins all connected, um, like what Kate All and Summer had talked about in their episodes, Pinterest would automatically pull those blog post titles. Now what um, Pinterest is doing is actually pulling those information out and making it more purposeful. So they want to see a pin title on everything, whether it's something you pull from your blog or whether it's an image that you're actually uploading to the platform. They want you to be more specific and purposeful with that pin title. Okay. So you're saying that they're getting ready to roll this out, that it's going to be mandatory and it's not at this point. So your advice is to get in the habit. If we're, we are a Pinterest user and we're utilizing this platform for uh, accessing potential clients, but what happens when it is mandatory for those of us that, you know, maybe we didn't hear about it and we didn't make this change. Is it just going to just dramatically reduce our ability to be found? It won't reduce it, but the biggest change will be when you go, do go to pin something new, Pinterest will prompt you to specify a title. So if you're using um, a scheduling tool like Tailwind, which is really common for Pinterest, it's also really great. Um, it's right now, they've already rolled it out. It's already prompting you. So you're kind of getting ahead of the curve if you're using a tool like that. Um, and then when you're on platform, it'll just keep prompting you and it'll say, is this you know, is this the pin title you'd like to do? Or if it's completely blank and there isn't a pin title for it to pull, 
it'll just force you to type something in. Okay. Okay. And you know, let's take a second to talk about Tailwind because of course I, you know, I know that we've been told about Tailwind, you know, other times is, but what I'm not clear on is Tailwind a scheduling device for multiple platforms or is it specific to Pinterest? So Tailwind has um, an option to use it for Pinterest and an option to use it for Instagram. Okay. Which is pretty awesome. Okay. So then just for a second, since you know all this geek tech stuff, Hootsuite. Hootsuite you can use for Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, not Pinterest? Um, I don't believe you can. For Pinterest, I haven't I haven't used Hootsuite in a while. It's been a little while. Yeah, um, I feel like that it's there's like a disconnect there. I, I'm not the one who does this in my company, so <laughs> <laughs> um, I do use like another scheduling tool that's really common for um, business owners to use is Later, and Later will let you schedule on Pinterest, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Okay. So if you're looking to have like an all-in-one solution, that's my next best go-to. Okay. Um, Okay. So Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Yeah. I think for us, for the design community, we're mostly concerned with Pinterest, Instagram, and Facebook. Facebook. Random designers are of course um, on Twitter, but it's not our, it's not our home base. We're not really flying around there so much. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a different type of, um, it's just a different environment over there on Twitter, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. You wind up tapping into different people. So you have to go where your audience actually is is hanging out mm -hmm. and with interior designers, they want visual visuals right. are king. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and LinkedIn. So later doesn't do LinkedIn or you don't know. Um, I don't think, I don't think it does. Okay. Okay. Alrighty. So, you know, I just a little detour there. I got a geek on the line. I got to ask them these good questions. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about, I know we have been told many times by Summer and Kate and Allison and Leslie uh, Carruthers from Saver Partnership. These are all people who have told us how really important Pinterest is as a search because it's a search engine different than a social media platform like Facebook or Instagram. It is leg a legitimate search engine. And so talk to us a little bit about what you suggest as a Pinterest strategy for driving potential clients back to our websites. Absolutely. So in terms of content for interior designers, the thing that comes to mind for me as being an awesome strategy is showcasing content that shows what the room or the home looked like before you got started with them, what it looks like during your process of working with them, and what it would look like after you're all done, all that, the pretty end result. Um, and being able to take photos and videos um, and creating pins like before, after, um, blog posts that showcase that process, and social media content that you can break up all three of those stages and wind up being able to inform people of how you got from what it looked like before to this really pretty end result because a lot of people don't know how to go from point a to point z and being able to be able to incorporate that themselves or understand how you work with them okay and of course the mechanism for this is the blog post is that correct blog post is going to be a really big driver in um seo and, and it's that search result activity and it gives a really strong base for pinterest to pull content from and put it onto the onto the Pinterest platform so that people can find you visually, not just through the words you're writing in the post. Right. So what you're saying too, so I understand it is we're not saying, Hey, it's day one, take pictures of the before, put it up on Pinterest. Two weeks later, take pic pictures of the in progress, put it on Pinterest, you know, day 25, take pictures of the after, put it on Pinterest. You're saying, take all the pictures, write it in form, blog post about it, put all the pictures within the blog post. And then when the project is completed, that we put on Pinterest, that blog, we pin that blog post to Pinterest. Is that correct? That's right. And making, um, you have that blog post. You can also make a, a longer pin that kind of has like, Maybe a little image at the top that says before, a little image in the middle that says during, and a little one at the end that says after, and a prompt to like visit the blog post or read more. It inspires that that curiosity factor that people are drawn towards. So it'll get people not only saving your pin on Pinterest, but actually clicking through and going to your website, which is ultimately where you want them to be. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And so 
are there other particular strategies? So I love this before, during, and after. And what you're saying is in your experience, now you mentioned to me off air and I'll share right now that you have been an active Pinterest user, tinkerer, you know, whatever we want to call it, since Pinterest was in beta. <laughs> That's like beyond my thought. <laughs> so, <In a> while. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. So you really are very quite expert at this platform. So, and what you're saying is from the standpoint of our businesses and to your designers, that that before, during, and after is super, super powerful. It is, absolutely. I've seen it work so, so well for so many different designers and decorators and even people with a, a DIY slant to kind of home, de home decor and home design. Mm -hmm. They really see their traffic skyrocket by showcasing that before, during, and after in their content. Okay. And then for, for us though, we don't really want, we want to show our expertise. We want to share some tips and ideas, but we really ultimately want the users on Pinterest who come to us and find us to hire us. Okay. So mm -hmm. the thing about that is, is, is that in the content of the blog post that maybe we share so much of the process that, you know, like I know me it's like as soon as you tell me this thing takes 10 steps to do unless I'm completely comfortable in whatever process we're talking about my brain just goes okay how much can I pay you to do it for me right like I like so it's good that you overwhelm me and it's good that you say oh Luann you should this and this and this and this because I'm going to literally say yeah I've got work to do why don't I pay you to do the work that you do well so is that is, is when we write our blog post would you recommend that we should that that approach of sharing enough of the information that it just creates that feeling of there's no way I could do this without the help a little bit yeah and having a, a call to action kind of somewhere within that post whether it's at the beginning middle or end wherever it feels natural to say you know what this is our process we're giving you a taste of how how we get from point a to point b and we'd love for to be able to take that work off your hands let us do what we do best so that you can have the time to do what you do best Right, right. That's a nice way to say it. I love that. <laughs> okay. I like it. All right. Now, any other particular blog post strategies that are effective for our visual creative industry that you're aware of other than the before, the during, and the after type post? Absolutely. So video is really, really huge right now. It's big on Pinterest. It's big everywhere on social media, to be honest. Um, I've been having clients actually take their videos and embedding them within blog posts. Um, so that gives you another form of media that you can pin to Pinterest. You can also share it on YouTube. You can share it on Instagram, on Facebook, everywhere. It's a good cross promotion tactic to be able to get people the content that they want to digest in the format they want to digest it. Because some people are huge video consumers. Other people like to read and other people just want to see pretty pictures. So giving people content in a way that they want to digest it makes, say, one piece of content, one blog post, it stretches it and it gives it more leverage with your with your audience. And it makes it so that you can connect with different people in new ways. OK, so so taking our before, during and our after and thinking about your exact point of leveraging it and using it in different mediums. If we were going to make that video content, are we? Are you suggesting that we run through the before, during, and after, or are you saying give a video teaser that says, "Hey, I did this great renovation, and I've got before, during, and after pictures. We had a particular thing that was super challenging, but we solved it. Head to the blog post to read it. Like, do you have to do? You know what I'm saying? Or am I going through the video as if that person is not going to go to the blog post and read it? You can do short form. So to give people a taste of your process, maybe you have a, a quick over the shoulder video of say three minutes of you working up a design on the computer or of actually going in and doing an install process or maybe it's brainstorming on an actual pin board in your office. It doesn't have to be the whole process end to end. That would bore anybody yeah, to tears. that's what I'm thinking. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, well, but having little, little chunks like, short videos that wind up catching the attention within the first, say, three to 15 seconds, drawing people in and giving them enough of a taste of who you are and how you work that they want more. 
Okay. Now, you just said something. Capture attention within the first 3 to 15 seconds. That's a very tall order there, Vanessa. Okay. Um, I know it. I yes. know it. <laughs> and, and I have read, and when I read it, it made perfect sense to me. And I don't know where I read it. And maybe I watched it in a video. I have no idea. I don't know if it was... Amy Porterfield or whoever it was, but I remember somebody saying, don't start the video, even if you're doing like an IG stories or a live, you know, hi, it's Luann here. How are you today? It's like, they know who you are. They're on your channel. Just start talking to them. You know, do you agree with that? What are some particular tips to get that first three to 15 seconds of attention, Vanessa? I absolutely agree with that. People know who you are. And if they don't know who you are, Somewhere in that video, typically at the end, you're going to tell them who you are. You're going to give them that little reminder of who they're actually watching or listening to. Um, you want to go get straight to the point, dive straight into the meat of whatever you're discussing. So if it's a tip for interior designers on how to do something, dive straight in, cut to the point, be really, really concise, and capture that attention right away. People don't want to wait. People are so impatient. Yeah. And we're seeing that across every single social media platform out there. And the thing so the is, quicker you can get to that point, the better. Right. And the thing is, what we know is, is that that first, whether we spend 10 or 20 or 40 or 50 seconds, that's us getting comfortable. <laughs> that's exactly what that is. It's, hi, how are you today? You know, it's us gathering our thoughts. It's us, whatever. But that does not serve the platform and the audience that we're at because we have three to 15 seconds. Because if you spend all that time, that precious first 15 seconds doing that nonsense, getting yourself, you know, a wrapping your brain around what you're doing that you've, you've wasted time and you've you're going to lose people. Right. Totally. Right. So do you have any, so, you, so the one thing is get straight to the point, just go right to, um, do we even say hi? I mean, I'm going to ask like really basic questions. Do we even say hi, it's Luann, or do we just say, Hey, in the middle of this kitchen renovation reno today and take a look at the backsplash that we're putting in. Like, do we just go boom right to it? I've seen it work well both ways. So mm -hmm. some people that are super comfortable going, Hey, today we're talking about kitchen backsplashes. They have that approach. Other people just dive right in mm -hmm. today. We're talking about X. Okay. Okay. And then you know, you are one of many Power Talk Friday experts that have told us how powerful video is and how each of the platforms are moving more and more towards video content. But are there, have you had clients or associates and colleagues that you've just thought, yeah, you really shouldn't be doing video? <laughs> you know, I mean, because like what I'm saying is, is we talk about, and I'm going to go back to that in a moment, how important the blog is as the base to feed the pins, but not everybody can write either. I mean, not everybody's good on video. Not everybody can write. We don't, we're not all blessed with multiple superpowers. So is it, is it something where you just say, figure out a way to get good at video because it's coming or it's like, you know what, you don't like to do video, then, you know, do whatever. What's your thoughts there, Vanessa? I always recommend sticking with what you're comfortable with. I've seen people who are definitely not good on video. <laughs> I've actually told people, you know, it might be better if you focused on the written word or just audio or, you know, something that makes us get to know you in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, people who are comfortable on video and your audience responds to video, go all in. Um, the biggest thing for me is finding your comfort level with it. If it's not something you're comfortable with today, Maybe the time isn't right. It's something you consider when you are ready. Mm -hmm. If it's something where um, people want the video, but they don't want to put themselves on video, there's other ways around that. You can create GIFs. You can do audiograms of you talking and having some movements. So it kind of gives that concept of video without it having to be your face or you know in the room you're in. You can also... Um, use animated graphics to create videos and tell a story that way. So there's different options for getting around that video concept. Okay. You know, because it, it's a real thing. Not, we're not all good at everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> right. And so, so when we think about creating that initial level of content that we're going to put to Pinterest and, and these other locations, it is the written word. It is the blog post. It is video. Are there other options for uh, that you recommend to your clients, Vanessa? So for interior designers, um, good quality photographs 
are another key piece of content. Um, and those work well on Pinterest, on Instagram, even on Facebook. People love that high quality um, photography. Okay. Whether you're lay layering over um, a graphic to help you know bring it out, or whether you're just showca showcasing good quality um, photos with good lighting, and that kind of give you a sense of sparking that emotion of what it's like to be in that finished room. Right, makes sense. I mean, I I we always say here, you know, thank God, most of you know all the the designers they have projects to photograph like I think to myself what do accountants do <laughs> you know what I mean like <laughs> what do lawyers do well Jamie does a good job at it Jamie at hashtag legal she does a good job at images but there's a lot of industries that are, don't lend themselves to this visual type of platform of Pinterest and Instagram and so forth right that's right mm -hmm. and they and people who don't have that that wealth of visuals that's where they turn to you know stock video and stock photo to kind of make up for it um, but there's other platforms that are text-based that they shine on. Mm. But for somebody like an interior designer where you're blessed with this wealth of visual content, use it, lean into it. Mm -hmm. It pays off in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. So to give us some, a little bit more, you mentioned the rich pins and I know that we, they were discussed on the other episodes, but give us a little bit more of the nitty gritty of maybe possibly starting with a photograph or a project and how, what we need to do to that picture, what we want to, you know, how we want to schedule it to tailwind or later run us through a little bit of, of the, of the points in case anyone listening hasn't heard the other two episodes. Sounds good. So for, um, say you're taking a photo and you're putting it in your blog post, um, you're going to want to make sure that the file name of that photo just isn't like some random number or just pretty couch number one. Um, you're going to want to make it specific. So think of the file name kind of as your pin title and give it a purpose. Put keywords in there because the internet will find that file title and it will search it out. SEO is amazing that way. Um, Pinterest is going to search it out by finding similar images based on the, the image content. It's also going to look at the text in the file name, in the pin description, and in um, the metadata behind that photograph. So just a little technical. Okay. Yeah. So hang on for a second there. So if we are looking at a photograph of a beautiful living room that has a white sofa in it, what is an effective file name? You're saying don't call it white sofa because I'm thinking that's what somebody would search, you know, living rooms with white sofas. What are we, what are we putting that file name as? So if there's some context, you can give it like white sofa and a soft modern living room. Oh. That gives it a little bit more purpose. It gives you a few more um, keywords that you can tap into too, but you're definitely going to want to pay attention to what people are searching on Pinterest. So if you're finding that white sofa itself is effective and there's enough search volume, that might be a great keyword. Um, but if it's say modern white sofa is actually what people are searching for, then you're gonna wanna include those other little words in there too, to give it enough of a push with those keywords that it'll pull up when they do start searching for you. Okay, and I'm trying to remember some of the tips from Summer and Kate, but are we also saying that if we're looking at a living room shot that has the white sofa, but maybe also has, I don't know, a, a gold metal coffee table, are we pinning it one time saying modern white sofa and pinning it another time, the same photograph and saying modern brass coffee table or are we putting it in the description how are we maximizing the different elements in a single photograph I don't recall how to do that so what I like to do is to take all those different descriptive words the brass coffee table the white sofa and put that in the pin description itself so that you have one high quality pin um, that you it's keyword rich it has everything that somebody could be looking for and it that'll make it pop up in different search results so if someone who was just searching for the brass coffee table, it would still pop up. But if somebody was searching for a white sofa with a brass coffee table, it would also pop up that way too. Okay. I love it. Okay. Okay. So we're starting with our actual picture that we're embedding into our, our blog post. This is where we're naming that picture, the file in our computer before we blag uh, embed it into the blog post. Correct? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Where are we going from there? Um, once you have that file, I'll good to go on your computer. You're going to pop it in your blog post and just check when, whenever you pull it over into whatever your blog is hosted on, whether it's WordPress or Squarespace or show it, um, that all that information is pulling up into um, what's called an alt 
alt text field. So that's where your pin title is going to pull from. So you're just going to make sure that file name pulls through nicely. Um, and in the metadata, that's where your pin description is going to sit. So I like to make sure that I'm taking the pin description that I would use, putting it in that metadata so that if um, somebody pins straight from my website, it's popping up from day one. And then when I go to pin it to Pinterest, I'm also double checking it that it pops up there as well, just to make sure that everything is working cohesively. Because okay. you know, the internet tech technology doesn't like to work nicely for everybody all the time. Oh, no, no, that's not true, is it? <laughs> it works perfect for me every day. <laughs> So not. <laughs> <laughs> I feel with it did, but the reality is things could go wrong. So I double and triple check everything. Just be <laughs> Okay. All right. So now we've got it in our blog post. We've pinned it. Of course, we've written our blog post and we've considered keywords in the content of the blog text as well, right? Not just Absolutely. in the pictures, right? Okay. And then we've pinned it to our Pinterest board. Anything else that we have to do to this bad baby once we've done this or just wait for it to do its magic, Vanessa? You can create a couple of other pins and actually put those in your blog post as well, or you can just put them straight to Pinterest. I recommend having at least one nicely designed pin um, that gives you maybe the title of what the blog post is about, uh, that they could read more about it on your blog, and then your website URL somewhere on that image um, so that you have at least two, a minimum of two different visuals that are being pinned from your blog over onto Pinterest. Okay. So what you're saying is one is going to be an image in our blog post that we're pinning to Pinterest. And then you're saying separately, create an image for a, a pin in Pinterest that is its own thing that now is linking back because the URL is embedded. So one lives, starts at our blog, the other starts at Pinterest, and one is designed in the Pinterest format, and the other is simply pulling from the blog. Am I understanding correctly? Yep. And you can take that image that you designed for Pinterest, and you can actually put it in your blog post somewhere as well so that people can see it on a couple of different places and choose the image that they actually want to pin. Because okay. some people have that preference to pin the photograph. Other people like to see um, those design pins is all they like to pin to Pinterest. Okay. Okay. Understood. Okay. So this is our number one mechanism for, you know, using the Pinterest platform to drive business back to our website. Um, are we also able to do this? I know we just mentioned the whole video thing, but are we, if we embed a video in our blog post, we're pinning the video just like we would pin a picture. Did you, is that what you meant? Yeah, you can pin videos um, from your blog post. If you have, say you have that same video that's in your blog, so you have it living on your YouTube channel too, you could actually pin it straight from YouTube and direct people over to your YouTube channel. Mm. Okay, 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 very good. All right, now, what else What else do we want to do on Pinterest? Do we? Is Pinterest a place where we just put our stuff out and we don't have to go play in the sandbox and look at other people's stuff and pin other people's stuff? Does any of that matter if we go and like other people's pins or pin them to our boards? It's always a nice thing to share your content and somebody else's. Okay. Let's face it, we don't, we don't all have a million hours to create tons and tons of content to be able to grow your profile enough to draw the right amount of people in. It really does take that community aspect. Um, so by finding other people's content and your content, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're finding content that can either educate, inspire, or entertain your audience in some way. Okay, so find content that can educate, inspire, or entertain. That's I love little actionable things like that. You see, I could look at Pinterest now and think, is this going to educate somebody? Is it going to inspire them? Or is it just going to entertain them? That gets you focused, right? As opposed to what the heck should I pin here? So, and the point of this is now we are going to create our own boards. And do we, do should our boards be a mix of, our own pins and other people's pins? And do we have certain boards like our particular design work? Of course, that's our design work. But if we're going to have, is there a recommended number of boards that we should have, a recommended way to title them, and a recommended mix or um, separation of content? So what Pinterest likes to see is not 10 million boards. Like they want to see kind of a less is more approach. So the boards that you do create, um, you don't want to have tons and tons of them. There is a maximum on the amount you can create, and that number kind of changes over time a little bit. Um, 
you're going to want to make sure that you have some boards that are just your content. So your design work, your blog posts, um, maybe your kind of inspiration of just your work. And you're going to want to have other boards that are a mix of, say, your work and somebody else's work. And I like to think of those, especially for interior designers, as the mixed boards being the boards that could really inspire people and giving them, say, if you had a board just about a modern farmhouse interior, having some of your work that fits that description and some of somebody else's work so that you can actually direct your clients to your Pinterest site to have a look through all these different types of categories and find the visuals that work for them and kind of spark ideas for what they want their interiors to look like so that you can have that visual sense and work with them a little bit more effectively. Okay. And do we need to think in practical terms, for example, if I'm an interior designer and I'm located in Nashville, Tennessee, if I'm going to do modern farmhouse kitchen and I'm going to create a mixed board, do I want to specifically like not include designers that are also in Nashville, Tennessee because, or does that not matter? Or is that just being icky or is that just being practical? I personally don't, I don't think it matters. Um, I've for myself and my own business, I've pinned somebody else who knows Pinterest or knows Instagram and I pull their content in as long as I see that there's value in having it and kind of directing people towards other similar content. If people love me and want to work with me, they're going to come back to me every single time. I love it. I love it. There's always enough room for everybody. Very good. Okay. Now, how do we, if we are an interior designer that 100% prefers to work in our location as opposed to doing e-design or interested in traveling to other areas, what are some of the tactics that we can do so that we are hopefully not attracting people who are pinning our stuff from Australia and we're in Nashville. How do we work, you know, work that out? So you're going to want to make sure that your keywords include your location. Um, So for, I've seen photographers do this really well in their description. They'll include that they are a photographer from, you know, Tennessee. And then that'll come up when people are searching for photographers in a specific city, their pins are going to be the first ones to come up as a designer. You could do the same thing. You could say the type of interior designer that you are or just that you're an interior designer in a specific city or a specific area that you want to reach. And that'll help um, your SEO kind of get localized is what they call it and being able to be location specific so that if people are searching out people in your location that you're going to come up more often in those Pinterest search results. And we're putting that in our probably our... um what I don't want you to call it the headline, you know, where, who we are, right. Our description of our business, but are we also putting that in the description, you know, modern white sofa designed by, you know, Sally Smith, interior designer, Nashville, Tennessee. Like, are we doing that in the description? I would put it right in the pin description, maybe not in the pin title, but definitely in that descriptive area where you have a few more characters that you can include that information. Okay. And you just, just figure out a nice way to put it. I, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, and I did this project in my hometown, like something, do we have to, my get, my point is, do I have to make it conversational? So it sounds like it makes sense. Or can I just stick the words in there and say, at the end of it, Nashville, Tennessee, it's your design, Nashville, Tennessee. I've honestly seen it work both ways. My personal preference is to be conversational. Like you're having, you know, like you would be on your blog post. You're not just going to be spitting out a bunch of keywords. Um, But I've also seen people with, they run at a character space. Um, and you don't have that room to be conversational, just popping in, you know, just the city and the state. And that works well, too. Okay. But the idea is, is if we could talk like a human, we should. We should. Yeah. <laughs> okay. A little bit nicer. Everybody appreciates that type of content so much more than, you know, just the, the ones that look like a bot just spit a bunch of keywords out and hoped that it was the spaghetti stuck to the wall. Okay. Okay. All right. But do you recommend if you, you know, if you're not using Pinterest as a hobby or um, I look a lot of interior designers do use Pinterest to create boards with their clients to really get a good sense of their style and what the client's expectations are. Right. But that's, that's a tool. But if we're using Pinterest as a method of attracting potential clients that's a whole different way of using pinterest and that's really the power of pinterest right there i know that to be true right um so do you say then if our number one goal is to attract more clients in the locale that we live in should we every pin that features our work 
have some way to bring in that conversation of that description, our location. Absolutely. Okay. So everyone, that's the thing. Not like one out of 10, do it every time. Do it every time. Cause you don't know which pin is actually going to take off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So including, including it in every pin is kind of like a little safeguard mm -hmm. that you're going to make sure that you get that point across to every single person that you work in this city with this type of people and they're going to find you. Okay. Okay. And then what about our boards? Do we need to have uh, location specific boards? And I think I remember Kate and some are telling us to do that. So wondering if it's still accurate information because these things change. And then are they, is there any use in, if I'm an interior designer, do I say, you know, here's, you know, my favorite tile shops in Nashville, Tennessee, and then pin things like that? Or is that like, where are you going with that? <laughs> um, it's definitely still relevant to have location specific boards that helps that SEO power a little bit more. Um, and then yeah, for great inspiration or education, you could pin the local tile shops or the local counter um, providers or even the local cabinet makers. If you want to feature those local people, I see no harm in having some boards um, that tie that content in too. Okay. And is it, um, is it make no difference if I just have a, a board that's titled local artisans, Nashville, Tennessee, and I put them all in there, or mm -hmm. is there, is there a point or a value in having one for several of them, the window treatment professional, the cabinet maker, the tile, you know, shops? I think it would depend on volume at that point. So if you're in a city that has, say, a really wide variety of um, people who provide cabinets or tile, then you might want to separate them out. But if you don't have very many in the city that you're in, or if you just want to feature, say, a handful of each, having one board that brings them all together, that you can, say, direct your clients towards, you know what, these are all my favorite local um, design providers. Go check them out. See if one of them resonates with you. Okay. Understood. Okay. All right. Are there things that I haven't thought to ask about that you're sitting there saying, Lynn, this is one of the most important things. Why aren't you asking this? Um, I definitely think that people should always showcase their work in multiple ways. Um, so over the course of, say, a year, you could have one blog post and you could pin that same post at least 10 times to Pinterest over the course of a year to help bring traffic back to your um, blog post in a different way. So for myself and for my clients, what I like to do is create um, 10 different pins, not all at once. I do it kind of um, what you can. You can batch content and get it done, one and done. Um, but I like to see pin one the day that the blog post comes out, maybe one a week later. And then I start spacing it out kind of systematically where I'm going to be attracting people at, you know, seven days, 14 days, 30 days, 60, 90, 180, 270, and 365 days so that I can take that one piece of content and stretch it um, and keep bringing people back to it. Okay. And do you just simply repin it in its exact format every time or are you changing the descriptive words or the title each time? So if a pin didn't get traction right away, I might adjust the pin description. I might adjust the pin title. I like to create a brand new visual every time. So if I see that something is really working, one you know one aspect of a design pin is working, I'll kind of play on that um, and just kind of expand on it and make it look a little bit different. That helps to treat it as kind of a fresh piece of content for Pinterest, which Pinterest likes. And it helps me to see exactly what my audience is drawn to. Um, it might not be the very first design I came up with. There might be, say, the third or fifth one that works a little bit better. And that way you can learn from um, how people are responding to those pins and design your next batch of pins in a way that picks up on what people are actually drawn to. Okay. Okay. And when you work with uh, creatives, that's your specialty, creative entrepreneurs. When you work with creatives and they come to you and say, you know, my Pinterest game is just not what it needs to be. Everybody keeps saying that it's the, you know, one of the best drivers to new clients and to getting people to my website, but I have no idea what I'm doing. What are some of the first things that you ask a creative to analyze, evaluate, explore, you know, change? T take us down that. So I like to have people look at um, the description in their profile on Pinterest to see if it's descriptive enough. Um, to let people know exactly what they do, who they work with, um, what their expertise is. 
I also like to ask them how consistent they are at creating content in general and how consistent they are with actually pinning that content to Pinterest. Because a lot of times people might have fantastic content, great visuals, great videos, but they're not being consistent enough in how they put that same information out to their audience. And that's where it really falls apart and falls down. Mm. You don't have to pin a ton, but you do have to be consistent with what you are pinning. And so what would you suggest? What is consistent? Is consistent, you know, uh, one day a week, one, you know, one every day, five a day? Because, of course, I'm, I know you're going to say that we do it through tailwind or later. So we're not actually doing it in real time. But what is the recommended if somebody were going to, OK, uncle, I'm going to start a pincher strategy. Let me see if I can make this thing work. I honestly have seen. All, all different sorts of frequencies work. Um, what I recommend to people is that they pick a schedule and they stick to it. So if it works for you to pin three days a week, whether it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, whatever those three days are, that on those three days, you're going to pin the same number of pins every on that same, you know, three pins on Monday, three pins on Wednesday, three pins on Friday, whatever that volume and schedule is that you're sticking to it. Um, for myself, I have one pin a day go out and it brings enough tra enough traffic in on um, my just like my personal blog that it it keeps growing and I don't really have to put a lot of work into it which is awesome but it's that consistency factor I have the content feeding in you know on the same kind of schedule every single day one a day which isn't a lot um, but it's enough to where Pinterest is kind of analyzing that content on a continual basis and matching it with people so that my volume of views at least stays the same and when I do have extra stuff to put out it just kind of helps boost it a little bit along the way. So are you saying that the Pinterest algorithm is actually taking notice that Sally Smith is posting Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, three pins. She's done it every single Monday, and Wednesday, Friday for six months. And, you know, Susie, you know, Jones has done one Monday, one Thursday, one Friday, and sometimes she skips three and then she does it again. Like that's actually a noticeable thing that re reflects where and how your pins are found? Absolutely. Whoa. We're in the age of machine learning. It's kind of scary, um, but it's the same across every, <laughs> every social platform we're on. Facebook's doing it. Instagram's doing it. Pinterest is doing it. Those machines are, are scanning everything we're putting in front of them and trying to draw out patterns in behavior. And when it picks up on your specific pattern of behavior, in this case, and how often you're pinning and creating content, it's going to reward you when you're putting value-added content in front of your audience and they enjoy it. And it's going to um, penalize you if the, if the quality of the content you're putting out isn't very good and if, you're, if people aren't liking it. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, it's not really amazing. I'm smart enough to know that it's possible, but it's just, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It can be, definitely. <laughs> Especially if, like, say you get sick and something happens and life goes crazy because that happens to everybody at some point. Um, and you fall behind or I, I see a lot of people get discouraged if that happens. And what I tell those people is, you know, what, pick up and start again, yeah. treat it like a fresh start, yeah, pick a new true. schedule, stick to it. And over time, it'll pay off. I think the thing about it is, is that I love the idea that it's a search engine and I love all that stuff. And I think it's amazing, but it is a big task just to produce even one blog post a week. So when you are doing one pin a day, Vanessa, are you grabbing seven pins from one blog post a week or are you doing multiple blog posts a week in order to grab seven pins a week? So with using my personal blog, for example, I, I do a new post, say once a month. Um, I'll pin that out. I'll schedule that in. And I like to pin other people's content um, on that specific Pinterest profile. That's what my audience is drawn to over there. So for the one pin in a day that I'm doing for that profile, um, I'm mixing in a little bit dose of my own, say about 20% and 80% of it is somebody else's content, but it's matching people up with content that can educate them in some way or inspire them in some way um, that they like and that they want to enjoy. Okay. So 
let's let's get specific about this. So say if I was going to utilize Tailwind and I was going to say, all right, every Friday morning from nine o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to execute my consistent Pinterest strategy to make the Pinterest googly guy happy. Okay. So I'm going to sit there and say, I'm going to put out seven pins. I'm going to schedule them. And two of these pins need to be from my work. The other five can be like you said, similar like content. Okay. Similar content. So am I just at that moment, I'm going on Pinterest and I'm using the same search term that I'm applying to my own modern white sofa. And I'm seeing what other modern white sofas come up. I'm finding five that I like and I'm capturing them somehow into my tailwind and scheduling them or uh, do, is that when you pin somebody else's work, you have to do it in real time once a day? You don't have to do it in real time. Um, there's a, an extension for Chrome for Tailwind that you can actually go on Pinterest and browse around and find things that are relevant, whatever whatever it is you're wanting to pin, if it's that white sofa. Um, and you can select the pins that you'd like to schedule in Tailwind using that extension. And it'll pull those pins over into Tailwind so that you can choose when you want to schedule them and make any adjustments to that pin before it actually gets scheduled in to be put out on Pinterest. Now, when I take somebody else's pin into my Tailwind and I schedule it, am I redoing the pin title and the description of it, or that's their pin, their title, and that's how it stays, sweetie? Um, in some cases, if somebody has a really good quality pin description, I just leave it alone. Um, ones that aren't as descriptive, I'll actually beef those up and add in other keywords that can help that same pin get noticed. Well, isn't that a little weird? I mean, do you say in this, do you, when you change somebody's description, do you, you know, is it necessary to say, found this pin from XYZ interior designer, love the modern white sofa and the brass coffee table, you know, like, you know, like, do you have to credit? Like, in other words, you would never repin. It's very, very, you know, bad protocol in Instagram to repost somebody else's work and not say, this is the work of XYZ interior designer. I mean, you know, you get lambasted if you do that. So is it not the same type of thing in Pinterest or is it? It is the same type of thing on Pinterest. It's a nice thing to credit the original creator. And I would never delete that sort of information, but I might add in Say their description is like white sofa, you know, created by so-and-so company with a link to their, um, back to their website. Mm. I might beef that up a little bit and say the picture has that white sofa and, oh, it's got a brass coffee table and some cool, strong black frames on the wall. I'm just going to add that in. I might even add what I like about it. You know, I love the, I love the throw pillows on this white sofa and just add a little bit to that description so that it just gives a little bit more oomph. So that people can find that same pin that I repinned for somebody else's website, but they're going to find it through my Pinterest profile because I gave the um, keywords a little boost to help help it be found a little bit better on Pinterest. Okay. And we don't have to then do the shout out to the person because it's in the pin title itself that it was Sally Smith's design. So we can just say to it and, you know, also loving the, the, you know, the hot pink sofas on the modern white sofa. I mean, pillows on the modern white sofa and that beefs it up and her original credit lives there. Absolutely. And it'll still link back to her website. So she's still getting the credit a couple oh, of different ways. Good point. Okay. So even though we pull something into Tailwind from somebody else's, the link back is still going to that person's uh, website. Well, that's good. I like that. That makes it so that we're not, we're not really stealing their work. I mean, we are, it's still going to go to them and they're saying, wow, somebody else pinned it and I'm getting their followers possibly to my website. Yeah, exactly. So you're, it's kind of a community concept. Like it's no different than you word of mouth telling somebody that, you know what, you like that tile shop and directing them towards that tile shop in your town. Mm. You're doing the same thing on the internet. You're just directing them from your Pinterest profile. You're saying, Hey, I found this cool thing on somebody's website or that links to somebody's website. You should go check it out. Okay. And so, so now to get to very basic, you know, business strategy, if I'm going to take my time every week to do this, there's a, one part of my brain, I get the whole ships rising, believe me, I'm the biggest proponent of that forever and ever. But what I'm saying is, is that 
if five out of seven pins are pinning to somebody else's website, the actual benefit to me is the algorithm seeing that I'm pinning every day and maybe I don't have enough content to pin seven days a week. So this is how I am being a good human in the community. I am getting my own credit with the Pinterest, you know, googly guy. And until I build a portfolio, this is a legitimate way. And the two a week are my two a week that are my content are more likely to get noticed, even though five a week are not my content coming to my website because of the consistency. That's right. And over time, as you grow your profile, and maybe you Maybe you're not blogging consistently now. Maybe you get consistent. So that gives you more content that you can put on Pinterest. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you aren't on Instagram today, but maybe, hey, let, I'm going to start an Instagram profile. I'm going to be really purposeful about that. You can pin that Instagram content over to Pinterest too. So you can, there's multiple ways that you can still beef up your content, build out your Pinterest profile, and slowly expand your content strategy so that it's not overwhelming straight from the start. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So we really could even set aside a three-hour block of time and spend one hour searching Pinterest for pins that align with our brand aesthetic of other people's work, saving them all into our tailwind, and then putting on, you know, creating a blog post uh, once a month. So you're saying once a month blog post with three or four of your own pictures in it, then rounded out by other people's work is a, a legitimate strategy. It is. Yep. Yeah. And it's a great starting point. Um, and from there, if you decide that all you want to blog is once a month, stick to it. Some people like to say, do that for a year. The next year they might add in say two a month and go to a biweekly schedule, mm -hmm. whatever is going to feel natural to you and whatever you have time to do, any content you create is going to be so beneficial in the end. And let's take a little bit about the actual content of the blog. I have uh, read a gabillion interior designers websites and therefore their blogs. And some are full blown stories that you, that draw you in, explain to you what they're doing. As you mentioned earlier, the process that they've gone through with a particular project or whatever. And others are simply six, seven, eight amazing pictures with two or three lines in between each picture that sort of just bring you to the next, the next photograph. Does the, the blog to be effective have to have some actual content or those two or three lines with all of the pictures is, is all that's necessary. Those two or three lines can be really effective. Um, I've seen people that say, take this, just those pictures with two or three lines of content, as long as they have keyword rich, um, that there's the right keywords that people are actually looking for in those two or three sentences, that same kind of more visual blog post can be found just as easily as the, as the long form content. Mm. Obviously the long form, the longer blog post has an easier chance of being found because there's more keywords in it. But both are effective um, in different ways. Okay, that's interesting. That's interesting because you know, there's like just like people don't like video, people don't like to write. But if you have good work, pictures of your work, you can put a couple of sentences together in between. And I've seen a lot of uh, design blogs that are like that. That it's very, very light on the copy, but and much more photo driven. And you know, we're there's sometimes you're in the mood to just basically read a story through the pictures, right? And other times you want to really hear the designer speak to us and tell us about the challenges that they had with the project and what the homeowner desired and yada, 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 right? Absolutely. And you can have a variety, maybe in, um, if you're blogging once a month, maybe in a quarter, you might have one that's a long form blog, one that's a more visual and one that is a good mix of both. Okay. Okay. All right. I love it. I love it. It's awesome. So it's, um, you know, we just, it, it you know, on one hand it's overwhelming because it's another thing to do in our business, but I feel like because it is a search engine, we all, I, I feel like as an industry, we do spend so much time in Instagram, communicating in Instagram, talking to each other about our Instagram. And because um, it's very, you really feel it there in Instagram, the community, because we know each other and we talk to each other. And I haven't spent a lot of time in Pinterest and it doesn't feel the same way. And I think that's why there's less of an emotional reward. But I know that the reward to our business is has much more potential through Pinterest than Instagram. You agree, right? 
Absolutely. And I like to take, um, for example, say I am knocking it out on Instagram and I'm getting lots of engagement and that good sense of community and I'm getting my clients off of there maybe a little bit just from having those conversations over time. What I like to do is actually pin those Instagram posts over on Pinterest so that I'm tapping into people who might be looking more for that visual content, but they find my Instagram post, click over to my Instagram profile and can engage with me, get to know me. And eventually they'll come back and they'll work with me. Um, whether it's from visiting a blog post on my website or that conversation I do have with them on that more engaging social platform. Okay, so that's interesting. I, I missed that when you said that earlier, but if you are pinning from Instagram, if somebody clicks on it in Pinterest, it's gonna bring them to your Instagram feed. Yep, that's right. Oh, well, that's interesting. I like that because I think that's very, that's a, um, I think that's a worthwhile endeavor for interior designer because as we said, the Instagram is the best place to really feature your high level photography. I mean, Pinterest, you, you, it's just like, there's so much on Pinterest. You know what I mean? It's like Instagram, yeah, it's there's really your hard feed. To yeah. It's hard to, to, you know, curate it, you know, use that crazy overused word, but it's hard. It just almost seems a little loud. Right. Um, but if you can attract some attention from Pinterest back to your Instagram, if that's where your, you know, really great work is, I, of course the website is always the best as well, because then they get all the other information about you. But but um, to your point of having that conversation, if they get to your Instagram, now maybe you have the chance to talk to them before they, because at your website, it's them checking you out, them finding out about you, but you're not necessarily, you're not able to engage with them until they take the step to email or call you. But on Instagram, it's a much softer um, way to open the door and way to um, have conversation started, right? Absolutely. It's less intimidating over on Instagram. Mm -hmm. They might ask one question or say that they like your work or, and it's on you to kind of build that relationship a bit, but it's more casual, kind of like running into somebody in a coffee shop and right. just starting that conversation. Right. Exactly right. I love that because you could, you could run into somebody in a coffee cha shop and they could say, oh yeah, my friend told you, you're told me that you're a designer now. Yes, I am. But it's not like my friend told you I, you're a designer and I don't want to hire you. I just saying that. <laughs> Whereas you, you email or call somebody, it's like, hi, you're a designer, but I don't need one. <laughs> I don't need one right now. Right. I get to know you first and then maybe, you know, a couple months down the road, come back to you. Right, right, right. And they could, and we do know that potential clients will stalk us on our websites and spend time on our websites before they often will ultimately make that overt contact with a phone call or an email. But the the point is that we're making is the Instagram, it could be a two-way conversation that's non-confrontational and non-threatening and non-big deal. I like that. I like that. Okay, that's very good. Did we leave anything out here, Vanessa, that we should cover? Or um, so we talked about that the profile should be description. It should say who we are, what we do, and who we do it for. Right? We said yep. that our board should be a mix of our own work. Some, if we're interested in working specifically in our location, some uh, geo-specific boards where we can feature area retailers and craftsmen and different people in our own town that we should be consistent. And if consistent is twice a week and that's all we can handle, then that's better than one day, one week, and then one day in two weeks. It's like, get, get, let the googly Pinterest guy know that we're serious and we're going to show up. Um, and that we, it's okay to do 20% of our own work in the beginning if we want, or all the way through and 80% of other people's work. But we make sure that we're a good human being and he, good he, community member and keep their proprietary information in there, but if we want to beef it up and put some more description in or make a compliment in there that includes a description, that might help it get searched better. Um, we said that we can pin video if we're comfortable on video. We said we've got three lousy seconds to make an impression, <laughs> which is <laughs> insane. <laughs> um, what other kinds? I think that's pretty much it. We, we, we covered a lot, Vanessa. Anything we left out that you'd like to wrap it up with or... Um, you know, what? I think we covered a ton of information today. I would say if you're going to have one link to link people back to in your profile, have it be your website. Okay. So the profile link to our website. I love that. That's awesome. And then you have a 
Pinterest audit that's available for us as a free download on your website, right? So if somebody just wanted to say, let me just see where I stand. Yeah, they can go over to my website at she'slatvision.com and they can download that. And what that um, download is actually going to do is it's going to walk through everything that I look for when I'm working with somebody and um, check off all the boxes to make sure that you have your Pinterest profile set up the right way for business and that you're not missing anything that could be holding you back from reaching your ideal audience. I love that. I love little things like that checklist where we can just say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I've got the, some of the, you know, most of the bases covered. Now I just have to go about intentionally creating the content and scheduling it. Or, yeah, I have a lot of work to do here, right? Uh, better to know to face the music and make the changes, right, Vanessa? Exactly. And it makes it less overwhelming to know that, hey, you know what? I'm knocking out a six out of 10 things. I only have four that I really need to work on. Mm -hmm. I can handle working on those four things. Mm -hmm. And then as far as working with you directly, tell me a little bit about that. Is it um, is it one-on-one -on -one coaching? Is it group coaching? Is it online coaching? What is your sweet spot with helping people improve their strategies for um, social media? Um, I have a couple of different ways I work with people. Um, I have a Pinterest course. Um, called Pinterest 101. So if people want to work on things on their own at their own time, that's a really great resource. It walks people through step by step how to create a Pinterest specific strategy, how to tie in a content strategy, and go from having no traffic to a good decent amount of traffic within a short amount of time. And then I also work one on one with people um, doing one on one services or um, just doing strategies and consultations, depending on what people are needing to do. OK, and we took the today to vote to devote and mostly to Pinterest. But do you work across all social media strategy platforms, Vanessa? I do. Yes. OK. Okay, that's awesome. I love it. So uh, I have to say thank you so much for sharing these tips with us for Pinterest and telling us about this new uh, thing coming out from Pinterest with the pin titles that we have to be intentional about making sure we fill that out. And of course, it's to our benefit, right? It's more another place to put those SEO words in that will drive everybody to us. And uh, I love it. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today, Vanessa. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so more instruction and education on Pinterest. And I have to say, um, I'm not so sure that it's as much that there's new, but you never know what little nugget in a conversation sparks something for you at that moment, right? And the thing why is that the thing is that I think it's important is because that what we keep explaining is that Pinterest is a search engine. It is not a social media platform. Doesn't mean social media platforms don't have their value, but search engine is a whole nother beast. And this is the place if we're going to work every day, building our portfolio, creating photographs, paying amazing photographers, for those photographs and then loading them onto our website. Well, we want to put eyeballs on that website, right? And Pinterest is a number one place to do that. It is the, I think they've said it's the number one search engine. If not, it's right there with the googly guy, right? So um, we need to do best practices so that we leverage it to our maximum optimal benefit, okay? Um, I love that there is that little nuance there of sometimes driving people to Instagram. So if you are particularly active on Instagram, that is a viable thing. Look, don't don't negate going to the website because the website has everything you do, right? It has your about you page. It tells them your work history through the portfolio. It tells you, um, you know, it, it, the blogs, the multiple blog posts that, that you have there about other things that create everything that is you as an interior design firm. Okay. So a little bit driving to Instagram to start the conversation, but the idea and the goal is to get them to our website. Okay. And especially if you have an opt at the website and then you just might tickle them and now you'll drive somebody to be on your email list which is the real real holy grail right so um, also nearing 500 episodes here. So I know that many of you say, oh, I love that episode on XYZ. Are there more like it? And that's why I'm being much more focused on sharing the episodes that go along with a show. So re-mentioning, 
Kate All, 331, Summer Tannhauser, 292, Allison Fannin, 223, and our friend Leslie Carruthers talked about Pinterest also on her episode 209. And then, of course, I mentioned Amber De La Garza at the top of the show, a productivity specialist, and her episode is 385. So if you liked what you heard today, these are good episodes to listen in conjunction with it. All right, before I go... Big, huge thank you to Kirsch, right? Our newest sponsor of the podcast, Kirsch.com. If you are doing window treatments, which I hope you are, and very, very profitable revenue stream for your interior design business, uh, then you need to know about Kirsch. Kirsch has been around for more than 100 years. And what I love mostly about Kirsch is, even though I've used them for nearly 40 years and relied on their quality and their products and the service from the area distributors that they have, I love that they're not just asleep at the wheel. They are reinventing and revamping all the time. The new Brisa motor, motorized collection is a perfect example. And the revitalization and the mixing up of the Buckingham collection is another great example. So please go to Kirsch.com com today and find out who the distributor is in your area and ask if you can have a visit ask them to come to visit you or you can visit them and you can see the products in the catalogs kirsch.com all righty and uh if you were paying attention you noticed that i announced the launch of luann nigara live it's about the conversation november 2020 if you want all the details as i have them ready please sign up for my email list luannlive.com if you're on my regular newsletter list. This is a different list just because I want to know who especially cares about Luann Live 2020 because you're going to get the information first. Okay. And then lastly, again, huge thank you to Vanessa. She's got vision.com. She not only has the Pinterest audit there, but she also has a, that self-guided Pinterest course 101. And that course is only 197. So maybe that's a good idea for you. Okay. Whatever it is, whatever it is, you got to do it. You have to take it from an idea into an action, right? Because that's how you make your business a little bit better every single day. And that's the whole goal, right? So please decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.